Good evening and welcome to the programme which, with your help, has now topped 200. In fact, it's reached 210 arrests as the direct result of viewers' information. Most are for very serious offences, 25 for murder and 87 for robbery, armed robbery and aggravated burglary. In fact, of the 500 cases that we've now covered on the series, a third have resulted in arrest. And of those that have already come to trial, five people have been acquitted and 158 have been convicted. The detectives behind us are hoping that you'll see something tonight that will help do more to tackle crime. In this month's programme, we have, as usual, reconstructed three serious crimes in the hope that viewers tonight will recognise something. In Tunbridge Wells, in a car park used by courting couples, police are looking for a man who's turned from a peeping Tom to an armed rapist. In North London, Lionel Webb, an estate agent, was murdered in his office. Did you know Mr Webb or any of his visitors that day? And in Middlesbrough, a smash-and-grab raid at a jeweller's in broad daylight in a busy shopping street. But first, some news from last month and the murder of Lorraine Benson. Lorraine, a 22-year-old photographer, was murdered as she walked to a friend's house from Rains Park Railway Station in South London. There was a remarkable response to that item in the programme, nearly 350 calls. And a week after the programme, a man was charged with Lorraine's murder. Our first case tonight is the smash-and-grab raid on a jeweller's shop in a busy shopping street in the centre of Middlesbrough. People from the shop next door ran out and courageously tried to stop the robbers getting away, but one of them was injured as a robber wielded a pickaxe handle. £26,000 worth of exclusive jewellery was stolen. Our reconstruction begins in Middlesbrough a month ago on the day the robbery took place. Middlesbrough is a large industrial town right on the River Tees. Having had the highest unemployment figures in the country less than two years ago, there are now clear signs of an economic revival there. It's famous for its transporter bridge, just a few miles from the town centre. At half past nine on the morning of Thursday the 9th of February, staff at Freeman's Jewellers in Linthorpe Road were preparing the shop window before opening as usual. Freeman's is a family business selling only exclusive top of the market jewellery and silverware. Sometime after 20 past nine that morning and less than a mile away from Freeman's, two cars were stolen. A light blue Ford Sierra disappeared from a public car park behind the Trooper pub in Wilton Street. And just round the corner, a red Ford Escort was taken from Southfield Lane, near Teesside Polytechnic. Just before midday, a witness saw that red Escort driving past the Dorman Museum in Park Road South. The car turned into Linthorpe Road, jumping a set of red traffic lights. Ten minutes later... Ah! Ah! taxi driver saw the end of the robbery and decided to give chase. Further down Linthorpe Road, a woman narrowly missed being injured as she and her friend were crossing the street. went straight down to the end, which is Prince's Road. I looked right, left, couldn't see any sign of them. So I went back out onto Linthorpe Road, round the block, back in through Clifton Street, and stopped at the top end of Pelham Street. I'd noticed the back alley as I came down. I thought I wondered whether they were in there. Looked down it, saw the car, and went straight back out for the police. The robbers had left behind a radio receiver tuned to a police frequency. Being into the town by a taxi. 
Just after midday, local witnesses remember seeing a light blue Sierra drive at speed into some private garages off Lansdowne Road, a mile and a half away. One of the two men who got out was carrying a black bag. The two stood on the corner for a moment, apparently debating something, and then went back to the Sierra. When they finally emerged from the garages again, there was a white plastic bag as well as the black one. Both men walked off down Lansdowne Road. Well, Detective Sergeant Strange is in charge of this case. It all happened in broad daylight in a busy place, and witnesses have given us a good description of the driver of the car during the robbery. How is he described? Yes, a video fit. The driver is described between 26 and 28 years of age. He has fair hair, which is short at the sides and wavy on the top, but not curly. He's very pale in complexion. Right. Now, also, several people saw the two men leaving the Sierra at the end of the robbery around midday. What descriptions have you got of those? Yes. Both males are described as being about 23 years of age, um, both of medium build. One has fair hair. He's wearing a light grey pullover with a black and grey diamond motif on the front. The other has got short black hair. He was wearing black tracksuit bottoms with a green vertical stripe and a black top like a tracksuit top. Oh, quite distinctive clothes. Now, the red escort was left in an alleyway behind the Quick Save car park, and at least one of the men probably escaped through a hole in the fence there because uh, one of the rings that were stolen was dropped right by the fence and found. And the jewellery that was stolen is quite distinctive, in fact, isn't it? Yes, it, yes in total, there's 41 diamond rings stolen. Um, they come to a value in excess of £26,000. I would like information from anybody who knows who has information relating to these rings and knows their whereabouts now. Right. Now, what do you need to know about the cars which were seen just on that morning? The cars were stolen between 20 past nine that day and 12 noon. Uh, the Escort was stolen from Southfield Lane, Middlesbrough, behind the Southfield pub. The Ford Sierra was stolen from Wilton Street car park behind the Trooper. I would like information from anybody who saw these vehicles being stolen. And in addition, I would like information from people who saw the thieves enter the Ford Sierra after the robbery. Right, and just to stress that the cars now have been returned to their rightful owners, so any, anything since February the 9th, please don't let us know. Only tell us if you saw them between 9.40 and midday on February the 9th. Now, this is the radio scanner that they left behind. What do you need to know about that? Yes, the scanner is sold by Tandy. We know it didn't come into this country until the 3rd of, or 4th of November last year. I would like information. Uh, I'd like the person who bought the scanner to contact us. Right. Or I would like information as to where and when this scanner was bought. Right. We know they're sold by Tandy. What we don't want to know is where that particular one came from and who bought it. Thank you very much. If you know anything at all that might help the police in this case, you can ring us now in the studio on 01811 8055 or ring Middlesbrough Police Station Direct on 0642 300 200. That's 0642, the code for Middlesbrough, 300 200. As you've probably realised and read, the police are taking measures to stop people listening in on frequencies like that. Now some more news from last month's programme. One man is in custody and has been charged with handling stolen goods from the armed raid on a jeweller's shop in Northampton. That was the one where the robbers made their getaway on a distinctive motorbike. Unusually, the information that led to the arrest came before we were even on the air. It was as the result of a feature about Crime Watch in the Radio Times. It's still not known where that motorbike was stored in the last week of November. If you remember, it's an unusual Yamaha 350 XT off-road bike and it was stolen in Norfolk. But other calls to Crime Watch have led to new inquiries which are now going on in various parts of England. In the case of money that went missing from an old people's home in Bedfordshire, a man was arrested in Hemel Hempstead two days after the programme as a result of viewers' calls. The man has been charged with ten offences involving theft, forgery and deception. At least six callers gave the same name for a man that we showed in photo call. He'd held up a building society branch and a similar man had been captured on video at a nearby car hire firm. A demand note used in the robbery was written on a business form issued by the car hire company. A gun has been recovered and a man is being interviewed. Sixteen items were claimed from last month's Aladdin's Cave. Several paintings and a jewellery box came from burglaries last year in West Sussex. A gadget helmet and two daggers were traced to a burglary at a hotel in Bickley in Kent. 
and the Bible and the prayer book we showed were reclaimed by a delighted viewer from Needham Market in Suffolk who'd been burgled the Christmas before last. Her grandmother had given her the Bible when she was five years old. Well, now the first part of this month's photo call. Pictures of people police want to interview in connection with crimes across the country. Here is Superintendent David Hatcher. In our first case, Essex Police want to speak to this man. On the 27th of February, he walked into a building society in South End. He brandished a gun, jumped over the counter and demanded cash from the staff. He got away with £2,000. We think the same man has done five other similar raids in Essex in the last four months. The first, in November, was in Romford. The staff compiled a photo fit of the robber who threatened them with a knife. The second attack, again in Romford, took place on the 5th of December and again a knife was seen. In the third attack, ten days later, the robber used a gun to threaten the Building Society's staff. The next day he struck at a Building Society in South End and got away with £3,000. On the 4th of January he was back in Romford and, as in two previous raids, he jumped over the counter to threaten the staff. But the most recent raid provided the clearest picture of him. He's described as being 25 to 30 years old, about 5 foot 9 inches tall, with a sallow complexion. Call us if you recognise him. Colleagues at Gypsy Hill Police Station in London need your help in locating this man. He's Mohammed Naeem, an Afghan refugee who may have vital information about the murder of a woman in November last year. 32-year-old Loretta Bateman died from stab wounds at her home in West Norwood, South London. Mohammed Naeem disappeared from his home in South London on the 20th of November. He may be staying in the Manchester or Birmingham area. He's 5 foot 7 inches tall and speaks with a slight accent. His hair may be shorter and straighter than in the photograph and greying. If you know him or his whereabouts, please contact us. Next, you know this man. At 4pm on Thursday the 19th of January, he went into the Cheshire Building Society in Spring Gardens, Manchester and under the cover of that newspaper he pointed a gun at the cashier who was forced to put money into a plastic bag that he'd brought in with him. He got away with a thousand pounds. He's about 35 years old, 5 foot 8 inches tall, with dark hair and a bushy moustache. He wore dark glasses with gold frames. Call us if you recognise him. Warwickshire Police are coordinating inquiries to trace this man, George Wesley Fisher. They believe he may have information about a series of deceptions that have taken place as far apart as Eastbourne on the south coast and Hexham in Northumbria. In each of the deceptions, which stretch back to 1985, elderly people have been conned out of cash on the understanding that goods would be bought for them at reduced rates. You may know George Fisher as Mr Roberts, Swarbrick, Allen or Flynn. He's 58 years old, though he looks older, 5 foot 10 inches tall, balding, with grey hair and tattoos on both arms. He's well built, has a northern accent and smokes a pipe. Call us if you can help with this or any of our other photo call faces. And here's the number if you think you can help, 01811 That's 01811 Our next case takes us to Tunbridge Wells in Kent. Since the middle of last year, there have been more than 20 reports of a peeping Tom seen at two particular car parks in the town, which are often used by courting couples. Last month, on the evening of February the 7th, a man got into a car at one of these car parks. He tied up the 18-year-old couple inside at gunpoint and then raped the girl. The victims have given us permission to use the words of their statements so that actors can tell the story. Some of the locations, the vehicles and all the names have been changed to protect the victims' identities. Here's Helen Phelps's report. Tunbridge Wells on the Kent-Sussex borders. It's a pretty Regency town, famous for its Royal Spa and the elegant Pantal shopping street. Rising up the hill and out of the town is a huge common, a mixture of sports fields and rough woodland with footpaths running through it. There are several car parks dotted across the common. Shoppers and walkers use them during the day, but after dark they're a favourite spot for courting couples. It's about 9.15 on Tuesday the 7th of February, the Kentish Yeoman pub in the heart of Tunbridge Wells. That'll be two pounds, please. Oh, cheers. Thank you very much, sir. Greg Simmons and Jenny Howarth have been going out together for almost a year. 
tomorrow lunchtime I'll have a look at the brochures. Alright then. I'm not promising anything, but I'll have we'll a look. We'll try. The couple left the pub after closing time and drove to the Fir Tree Road car park. They don't remember any other cars being there when they arrived. Oh, that's it. Right? A few minutes later, the couple were aware of another car driving in. It seemed to head down to the far end of the car park, but that was not unusual. Ten minutes later, Greg and Jenny were still talking and listening to music. They didn't hear the man approaching the car. Holding them at gunpoint, he tied them both up, blindfolded them, and ignoring Greg's pleas, he then raped Jenny. Suddenly, the door clicked open, and I immediately realised I hadn't locked it. Is that what you would normally do? Yeah. And then what happened? Well, I had my back to the door and I was facing Greg. And I turned round and saw a long barrelled gun pointing at us. Do you know what sort of gun it was? It looked like a shotgun. An incident room was set up at Southborough Police Station and a major investigation began. Appeals were made for other people who'd been in the area to contact police. The crime has shocked the normally peaceful community of Tunbridge Wells. It's nine o'clock. I'm Paul Chantler. Police are appealing for help from courting couples who may have seen a masked gunman raping a teenage girl on Tunbridge Wells Common. From the scene of the attack... Calls have been flooding into a special police incident room set up yesterday after a horrifying attack on a young couple in Tunbridge Wells. As well as the press coverage, posters were printed displaying the number of a confidential telephone line for people to call with information. But what the police needed most were more witnesses. As the calls began to come in, it was soon clear that this was not the first such incident in that area. Fairly quickly, a pattern emerged of at least 20 sightings in the Fir Tree Road car park, going back as far as last summer. A great number of these sightings gave a description identical to the rapist and were of a man or men peeping at courting couples in cars there. A very disturbing aspect of it was that as time passed, this man was becoming bolder and bolder. The first sighting was in June of last year, but then the man ran off as soon as he was challenged. By November, he was confident enough to invite a chase. In January of this year, he tried to get into a car. This time he stood his ground and taunted his pursuer. But in all these cases, very little of the suspect has been seen. That is until the rape. He was of medium build. Um, he was white. Um, from his voice, he was about 30. Uh, he was wearing a khaki jacket, an army camouflage type jacket with green and brown splodges on it. This is the type of weapon that has been described by the victim being used in the commission of the offence. It's a 12-bore, single-barreled shotgun, unlike what is more commonly seen, the double-barreled 12-bore shotgun which is used primarily for sporting purposes. This weapon is more likely to be used in rough shooting, and the victim has described it as having a full-length barrel, which would tend to suggest that it was legitimately acquired. If anybody has knowledge of a person who has access to this type of weapon and fits the description of the offender, we would be very pleased to hear from them. As soon as the rapist entered the car, he made the young couple lie face down and immediately bound their hands with plastic cable ties. Now, we found two other plastic cable ties identical to those he had used on a footpath a short way away. It may have been that he was practicing doing them up, or in fact that he dropped them. 
These cable ties are used for keeping bundles of cables tidy. They are very distinctive in that they have two markings on them. One is the manufacturer's marking, and over the, the other side, the model number, which is RLT120. That makes this particular tie distinctive. We've contacted the manufacturer, and he said that they haven't been manufactured in over a year, and they only put the mold on as and when they require it. We haven't found any outlets for it in Tunbridge Wells, and what we're appealing for is those people that have sold it perhaps in the past year to come forward and let us know about it. When the couple went into the car park, it was empty. Shortly after that, another car drew in. And after the rape, the same car drove out. They caught a glimpse of it, and we can say that it's a, a lightish colored saloon car. Greg remembers that it had a smooth engine around two liters in size. And there's one more important sighting. Witnesses have told us that around 11.30 p.m. on the night of the rape, a man was seen jogging up Fir Tree Road in the area of the car park. Now, this man could be a very important witness. We need to speak to him, and we're appealing to him to come forward. At 7 o'clock. In the incident room, detectives are sifting through the information gathered from the various sightings. Can you describe him? Well, how old for a start of? Would you say he was... A picture of the man police are looking for is slowly developing, but they still need more information. There may be other witnesses who have not yet come forward. Someone must know this man. Perhaps you can help. Well, if you can, you can ring us here on 01811 8055, or you can call the police in Tunbridge Wells direct on 0892 511055. The code for Tunbridge Wells is 0892, the number 511055. We're already receiving quite a few calls here to the studio on 018118055. Two particular cases seem to be getting some good results so far. On the Middlesbrough robbery at the jewellery store, a viewer has called in with a name for the driver of the Blue Sierra, and another caller thinks he recognises the man with the long blonde hair who we described. Help from information on this Tandy receiver is coming in too. It's a realistic Pro 34 receiver. Um, also on the, our photocall case, one of our photocall cases, Mohammed Naim, a caller with potentially valuable information called but hung up, so we'd like him please to call back. Uh, a caller from Manchester has also rung about him with a credible sighting that's being followed up. And another viewer says he knows him from South East London up to two months ago, so uh, investigating officer is following that one up at the moment as well. And now some more results from previous programmes. In October, we showed a picture of a woman who, with her boyfriend, had terrorised and robbed a 74-year-old man who was confined to a wheelchair. On February the 9th, at Teesside Crown Court, she pleaded guilty to robbery and burglary and was sentenced to three years' imprisonment. In that same programme last October, we showed a video of a robbery in progress at a building society office in East London. A number of viewers rang with the same name. And after a long search, a man has now been charged with robbery and possession of a firearm. And a similar video from our programme in October 1987 led to three arrests last month in connection with the bank raid in North London. Viewers thought they recognised two of the men, and they, together with a third man, have been charged with attempted robbery and illegal possession of a firearm. And last October, we showed a video of a man who posed as a customer at a jeweller's in the Kensington area of London. He picked up an expensive ring and ran out of the door with it. As a direct result of viewers' calls on the night of the programme, a man's now been arrested and charged with theft. Well, now to this month's incident desk. Can you help find the luxury cars stolen from outside a Berkshire factory? You'd know them if you've seen them. They're only six feet long. The violent hijack of two lorries. Why was one of them abandoned with thousands of pounds worth of cargo left on board? And in Norfolk, can you help find the mystery fraudster who lives a life of luxury on other people's money? With the details, here's Superintendent David Hatcher. First, we need your help to solve the murder of 43-year-old Alan Ellis from Hackney, East London. On Saturday the 20th of August, he left this pub just after 11.30pm to walk the short distance to his home on the Jack Dunning estate. As he approached an alleyway on Churchill Walk, he was attacked by two men. He was savagely kicked and punched to the ground by his attackers and died of internal injuries the following day. Both attackers were black and one was wearing a distinctive yellow and green jumper like this. A ring similar to this one was taken. The one belonging to Alan Ellis was cracked across the middle. Five days later, this man tried to sell an identical ring in a local jeweller's. 
He's about 20, tall and slim. So if you recognise him or you've been offered that ring, call us now. My colleagues in Norfolk need your help in finding a con man who's carried out nearly £200,000 worth of frauds and has conned at least 50 banks and credit companies since he first struck two years ago. He's in his 40s, 6 foot 2 to 6 foot 4 inches tall, well built with brown hair, usually smartly dressed and he speaks with a soft Lancashire accent. He's believed to be married with two teenage girls and a son aged about five. We think he may have used at least three cars, including a silver Range Rover with a horse mascot. The registration number is A894KGV. Also a green BMW, registration number C472YYG. And a silver Vauxhall Nova, registration number F551UFL. He uses various aliases based on the names of innocent people, such as Graham David Lord, David Waters, Robert Hughes and Andrew Quayle. Please ring us if you think you know him or his whereabouts. Next, the raid on a Bristol warehouse in which robbers stole over £25,000 worth of goods. On the evening of Thursday the 1st of December, a lorry arrived at this trading estate in Bristol. It had travelled down from Birmingham and was carrying household electrical goods such as televisions and hi-fis. At 5.30 the next morning, two employees were checking delivery notes. Lie on the floor. Get down on the floor. Down. The robbers used a distinctive red and blue scarf to bind their hands, which they then covered in parcel tape. Then they were locked in two cars parked in the warehouse. They filled a second lorry with electrical goods which were stored in the warehouse. The two lorries left the estate soon after six in the morning. Gordon Road, half a mile away. The only positive sighting of the two lorries together was at 6.15. A witness saw them heading in the direction of the M32. From the M32, we think they headed east on the M4. In the meantime, the two employees had released themselves and alerted the Bristol police, who warned neighbouring forces of the stolen lorries. Memory services, it's 10.15am. Reference the uh, stolen lorry from Bristol, the toll gate, Echo 684, Lima Oscar uniform. Uh, we found it on the eastbound Membry Lorry Park. Uh, further instructions, please. The lorry's load was still inside. We think the Coles lorry continued up the M4 to London. Seven days later, it was found abandoned and empty in Palace Road, Streatham in southwest London. If you can provide any information about this robbery, please ring us now. My colleagues in Hampshire need your help to trace a rapist who attacked a mother and her daughter in January of this year. About two o'clock on the morning of the 4th of January, the two women were walking along Cove Road towards Fleet. Just by the roundabout at Bramshot Lane, a man joined them. He told them his name was Steve and his car had overturned nearby. Well, when they reached a more isolated part of the road, he pushed both of the women to the ground, indecently assaulted the daughter and then raped her mother. The rapist is white, in his early 20s, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 9 inches tall, with dark collar length hair. He may have a scar or mark on his right cheek. He was wearing a blouson style leather jacket and light coloured trousers. We also need to trace a gold or beige coloured car similar to a Mark IV Ford Cortina. It was seen in the area just before the attack. If you can help, please get in touch. Finally, these cars stolen from Berkshire. Well, no self-respecting yuppie would be seen driving anything less than one of these very classy vehicles. Sadly, they're a bit beyond my price, price range, even though they're the children's size versions of the real thing. They're petrol driven, have authentic controls and cost nearly £2,000 each. Four cars like these were stolen on the night of February the 1st. The thieves took two red Porsches, a black BMW, but the Mercedes they took was a red one. 
They'd been parked in a trailer outside a company called Hope Works in Sunningdale in Berkshire when they were towed away by thieves. Each of the cars has its own stick-on number plates and a serial number etched on the near side chassis and in the boot. If you've been offered one or have seen them on sale, well, we'd like to hear from you. The number here is 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055. There's more news uh, coming in from phone calls. Mohammed Naim, more sightings of him in Manchester, at least thought to be him. On the Manchester robber, three callers have given names for the man who robbed a Cheshire building society back in January. And on the Tunbridge Wells rape, we've had really quite a large volume of calls giving police accounts of Peeping Tom incidents in that area and indeed further afield, which are very much welcomed by the investigating officer. And we've got some information on the ties that were used in that as well. Now, if you can think back to two weeks before Christmas, were you in North London, perhaps driving through Stoke Newington? Stoke Newington is on the A10, one of the main roads to the city from the north. On Sunday, December the 11th, you might have noticed that an estate agent was open in Evering Road. Or maybe you knew the proprietor, Lionel Webb. A Barbadian by birth, he'd lived most of his life in Birmingham, then moved down to London in 1985. On that Sunday, at around the close of business, with the lights in his office blazing, Lionel was murdered in full view of the street. Lionel had become a familiar face in Stoke Newington. He'd moved his business here from Edgware in October, and for weeks before that, he'd been supervising the refitting of the shop. Locals say even then, he was scouting for new properties to buy. Excuse me. Hi, I'm uh, Lionel Webb from the Property Developers Next Door. I was wondering if you uh, ever wanted to sell? Well, I bought this a year ago as an investment. How much? Well, 36. Well, I'd be more than willing to double that to 75, 80. Hmm. Yeah? Well, listen. Think about it and give us a call. I will. Okay? Take care. Bye. Bye. His plans were to acquire the whole row of houses around his office on Evering Road, opposite St Paul's Church. Five days before his death, on Tuesday the 6th of December, a white Datsun van was noticed parked outside Lionel's office. The witness remembers a man with a large hook nose and a tattoo on his hand. Was this you, or do you know who it was? Lionel worked seven days a week, and at 9 a.m. on the fateful day, Sunday the 11th of December, he set off from his home in Mill Hill. He was carrying a briefcase and a black plastic bag. About 11 o'clock on that Sunday morning, a man wearing a dark woolly hat got out of a red car and went into Lionel's office. Then there's a gap in sightings. Where did Lionel go that morning? because about two hours later, at 1.30, he was seen returning to his office. And he was seen to look up and down the road before entering. Then, it seems, he took a shower. A short while later, the woman who owned the corner property came round. She'd decided to accept Lionel's offer, but he'd failed to call her back. Where have you been? I waited in all day for you on Thursday to contact me. Yes, ma'am, sorry. I've got the money and the deal can go through, OK? Cash? 80,000. When? Come here tomorrow and we can sign the papers. OK. See you. Talk to you soon. OK, take care. About an hour later, at around 2.30, a man in his 50s or 60s was seen in Lionel's office. He was dressed in a smart trilby hat and grey checkered overcoat. Then, at about 3 o'clock, Lionel's secretary turned up. Hi. Oh, hello. What are you doing here? Just had a row with my boyfriend. Surprised he stayed so long. What do you mean? Was he ever done to you? Nothing. You're in a strange mood. Well, wouldn't you be if you had debts like mine? Well, everybody's got debts today. Oh, 2,000 to this person, 20,000 to that person. Come on, how am I going to pay that? Don't worry, something will turn up. Yeah, like what? I don't know, something will. Relax. <sighs> 
Lionel had promised to help his secretary buy a car, and she'd arranged for one to be brought round at four o'clock. The car owner told the police that Lionel offered just under £4,000 but asked him to wait till the end of the week for the cash. An hour later, at 10 to 5, a passing motorist saw two white men in Lionel's company. At half past five, a local handyman called in. He'd worked on Lionel's office. Time you went out, like you haven't got a home to go to. Sometime round then, Lionel rang a friend, but she remembers he had nothing much to say. You going to college tomorrow? Then she heard rustling in the background. Yeah, well, take care. Everything will be all right. Around the same time, two witnesses stopped briefly to look at the notices in the window. They clearly remember seeing a man in a dark suit and tie sitting at the desk, but they're confident it was not Lionel. Then, a black hatchback was seen to speed away from Evering Road. When the handyman returned, he found Lionel's door ajar. Bill Cutts, why? What was the motive? Well, maybe robbery. Um, there's a, a briefcase and £4,000 that uh, we never recovered, that we know he had or it more likely is a gangland revenge killing over drugs or money deals. Now, what's the link with drugs? Well, in the back of the shop, after the, the killing, the police arrived, they found two kilos of cannabis resin. Each kilo was wrapped in a clear cellophane packet. At Eddie's home in North London was a large quantity of amphetamine-based tablets. We must make it clear that we will treat with great discretion anybody who calls into the studio if they've had any dealings with drugs, uh, but if it's of a minor nature, the police really aren't going to be interested in that. This is a murder inquiry. Now, of the people who were represented in the film, obviously you need everyone to come forward if, if they think that they were represented there. The white man with the hook nose and the, the tattoo, that was on his left hand, wasn't it? On the left hand, yes, just between the, uh, the forefinger and thumb. And it definitely said mum, no question about no that. No doubt about it. That's pretty distinctive, and you obviously need him to come forward to eliminate himself or anybody else who knows him. Then there was uh, a black man in a very smart suit sitting at Lionel's desk. Yes, this was about 5.30, 5.45 in the evening of, uh, of the Sunday the 11th. Right, and the witness is convinced that wasn't Lionel. Yes, they're most certain that it wasn't the same man. OK, there's a black uh, hatchback car again. There's another clue you saw screeching away at the, uh, at the end of... The around the time of the murder. If that was you and you had nothing to do with this murder, for heaven's sake, come forward. And I also gather you've got some more evidence, literally in the last 24 hours, uh, about a 10-year-old girl. That's right. A passing motorist has just come forward uh, 24 hours ago and told us that he saw a 10-year-old girl walking past the shop at about quarter to six, which is the most important time, around about the time of Lionel's death. Well, obviously, uh, there aren't very many 10-year-old girls or girls of that age watching this programme. But if you are the parent in Stoke Newington of a girl, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, who could have been in Evering Road on Sunday, the 11th of December at 6 o'clock or thereabouts, please do call us. Here's the number to the studio if you can help with any of these, 01 811 Alternatively, you can try the incident room, that's 01 488 5212. 01 488 5212. Well, there are so many appeals for information this month that we have a second file of pictures that police are hoping will be recognised tonight. With more from Photocall, here's David Hatcher. First, do you recognise this man? His name is Carl Ronald Strauss, although you may know him as Kurt Kemper, Jürgen Riedler, Carl Schneider or Carl Hartmann. We believe he may have information about a lorry hijacking in Leicestershire in June last year, when £300,000 worth of Burberry coats were stolen. We featured the case last September. And we traced the Burberries to West Germany, where they'd been sold to an innocent German businessman. Carl Strauss was living in Bickley, Kent until till December last year, and at that time was using a green Ford Cortina with the registration number VOY455X. Carl Strauss is about 50, 6 foot 1 inches tall, with a heavy build and a ruddy complexion. He has a pock-marked face and fair hair receding at the front. He also has a noticeable German accent. Ring us if you know where he is. Next on photo call, a man who stands out because of his very smart appearance. He's certainly one of the best dressed robbers I've ever seen. On the 7th of October 1988, he was captured on this security video at the Alliance and Leicester Building Society in Station Road, Harrow, in northwest London. 
Dressed in a dark suit and tie and posing as a customer, he patiently waited his turn in the queue. He then discreetly pulled out a pistol from what appeared to be a small pouch bag and demanded cash in notes from a terrified cashier. Handing her a plastic carrier bag, he told her to take money from the cashier beside her as well. He waited quietly for the money and walked out with a total of £1,200. He's described as 5 foot 9 inches tall, medium build with dark hair and a pock-marked face. And of course that distinctive smart two-piece suit and tie. Call us now if you recognise him. Do you know this man? His name is William James Dunkeld and my colleagues in Spalding in Lincolnshire would like to speak to him about a series of thefts of lorries and their loads from haulage contractors throughout the country. Dunkeld may be known as Wildman, Smith or Mason. His nickname is Catweasel. He travels extensively, staying in guest houses. Dunkeld is 48, slim and 5 foot 10 inches tall. He has receding brown hair, a moustache and a northern accent. Seen him? Then call us. Finally, Essex Police believe that this man is responsible for two armed robberies at building societies in their area. During the first raid on the 4th of January, in which he held up staff at the Bristol and West in Chelmsford, the robber wore glasses. He had a gun and a rucksack-style bag with a shoulder strap to carry the money away in. In the second raid on the 8th of January at the National and Provincial Building Society in Colchester, he carried an identical gun and bag, but was not wearing those glasses. The man is in his late twenties, five foot ten inches tall, with dark brown short hair. Those glasses he wore on the first robbery had metal frames and clear lenses. Call us if you know who or where he is, or if you recognise any of our photo call faces. Here's that studio number again, 01811 8055, And from our first photo call, we're getting news in of a really quite large number of calls leading detectives to a particular area in Manchester. More and more calls are confirming this. But that is it for this month. We'll tell you more about how things are progressing in Crime Watch Update. That's after question time at 25 past 11. And you can catch up with any developments that take place overnight in open air tomorrow morning at 11.30. If you haven't called yet or you haven't got through yet, our lines are open until midnight. You'll find the relevant local numbers on CFAX, page 186, or you can write to us at Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London W12 7RJ. The next Crime Watch will be a month from now, on Thursday 13th of April. And after all that we've shown you tonight, we really need to point out, as always, we've compressed a lot of crime across the country into the last 45 minutes. Fear really is the greatest penalty we pay for crime, so please don't be frightened by what you've seen. Together, we're doing something about it, so don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.